Okay, now <clears throat> I'd like to introduce Mr. Frank Kelly, Chairman and CEO of BioHitech. BioHitech has 17 million shares outstanding, trades around $1.35 for a $23 million market cap and $34 million of net debt. Uh, Mr. Kelly has served as BioHitech CEO since 2008. Prior to that, Frank owned multiple waste companies along with being <clears throat> the co-founder and CEO of Interstate Waste, which was a sold to Advanced Disposals pr Private Equity Group in 2006. We welcome you here today, Frank. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, good morning, Tony. Thanks for having me again. Yes. Um, do you want to uh, do you want to start off, or how, how do you want to how do you want to do this? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm going to get started just a little bit a uh, little little different than our normal presentation mode, but we're right. uh, we're all we're all. <laughs> I know. I, I miss having uh, you. Yeah, we're all working through challenging times here. So yeah, absolutely. Um, let me get started. I'll get through. I'll get through our slide deck and sure. hopefully leave enough time for some uh, for some questions uh, and comments uh, later on uh, in the thirty minutes. So I appreciate it. Thanks Perfect. again, Tony. So again, folks, thanks for attending. I'm Frank Sully, CEO of BioHighTech Tech Global. Um, I'd like to start with uh, pointing out. A few uh, a few key data points that uh, a lot of people may or may not be familiar with um, that are very uh, very important to the bio high tech business plan and our products and services. So first, um, seventy nine point nine percent of all non recyclable waste generated ends up in landfills. Uh, Fourteen uh, percent or so of methane gas emissions come from landfills. Uh, Thirty to forty percent of the U.S. food production is ultimately wasted, which is a staggering number that most people are, are not familiar with. Uh, almost 22% of total waste deposited in landfills is food waste. Uh, again, almost about 20% of total waste deposited in landfills are plastics. Uh, food and plastics are two of the things we focus, uh, we focus on with our products and services at BioHighTech. And about 8 million metric tons of plastic a year actually end up in the oceans, uh, which is also a staggering number. So ocean contamination associated with microplastics is a, is a really hot topic in the environment these days. Uh, corporate and government leadership are seeking alternative solutions to kind of change the outcomes of some of these, uh, some of these data points, and that's where BioHighTech comes in. So what's the solution, right? How do we solve these problems? How do we have a significant impact, a positive impact on, on the environment? Right? In the United States, what we need to do is adopt cost-effective technology-based solutions. So uh, at BioHighTech, we change the environmental outcome by doing a few things, right? Uh, number one, we reduce or eliminate landfill usage for certain products. Uh, number two, we reduce food waste generation with behavior changing data and analytics, right? So transparency and understanding behaviors is critical to reducing the amount of food waste that is generated or any waste, quite frankly. Uh, we help lower carbon emissions uh, and other greenhouse gases by keeping waste uh, out of trucks and out of landfills. And uh, we hopefully help keep plastics from our oceans by deploying our food waste technologies uh, on living vessels of, of different types. Our three product lines, uh, our resource recovery facilities. You know, Tony, you've been hearing me talk about our facility in West Virginia for years now. Um, you know, this is a meaningful, uh, meaningful step towards progress in the United States. So uh, we are the exclusive uh, providers uh, and users of a patented technology out of Europe that converts waste into an EPA-approved, uh, recognized renewable fuel that can be used in alternative to coal. Uh, we're the only company utilizing this pr uh, proven and patented technology in the United States. There are facilities in Europe uh, that have been using this for years, but we have the only facility in the United States doing so. Uh, we're able to reduce landfill usage by up to 80%. Uh, we address the non-recyclable plastics problem. So plastics has been an ongoing issue uh, in the United States and in the world, quite frankly, uh, over the past years. Non-recyclable plastics are not a problem, a solution. Uh, and they're typically cost neutral to haulers or municipal customers, so uh, we're not coming at a premium to what traditional disposal might be. Uh, our on-site food waste disposal technology, that is our kind of core platform product. We manufacture aerobic digesters. We install them where food waste is generated. 
Uh, we use biology to convert that food waste into a liquid that can be safely discharged down a sewer line. Uh, by doing that, we eliminate carbon emissions from the transportation, from the landfill disposal, uh, certainly sanitary improvements, so reducing pest problems, uh, bugs, odors, uh, vermin, so on and so forth. And in this particular case, we can typically be 30% lower than the cost of traditional waste collection and disposal. So very cost effective, which we think coming out of COVID-19 is going to be something our customers are really, really focused on is, hey, we need to watch the pennies and here's a way we can improve our environmental footprint and save some money. Uh, in doing that with our digesters, our patented cloud-based analytics platform is critical for our customers. Again, you know, we believe our customers are coming out of this saying, hey, how do we save more money? How do we better track what we're wasting? Uh, savings is critical. So by providing transparency uh, with our patented IoT technology, we differentiate ourselves from any product that is out there in the market today. Uh, we provide actionable real-time data uh, for supply chain management, which is important, and you know, information can help our customers achieve better behavioral um, practices to reduce their food waste generation, ultimately reduce their food consumption, which is really uh, a huge economic impact for them. We saw that our resource recovery uh, facilities talk a little bit more specifically about what do they do, how do they work, uh, what are these things, right? So people have been hearing me talk about it for years. Uh, we actually have some action with real-time data now to share. So, um, this slide does a good job, I think, of, uh, <clears throat> of an example of the status quo, which is on top. Typically, waste collection vehicles collect residential or commercial trash. Um, they will, in many cases, deposit that trash in a transfer station, which is just a facility where they can offload uh, and waste haulers can aggregate that waste into larger tractor trailers and then haul that off to the landfill. So you can kind of see you know, from the cradle to the grave, what that model might look like, right? Small trucks, aggregation, longer trucks, long haul, 95% or so would end up in a transfer station. It's going to end up in a landfill uh, in the United States. On the bottom, you see those same collection vehicles. Uh, instead of utilizing a transfer station, we're utilizing our facility, for instance, in West Virginia, where that waste is then put through the three-step patented process, where we'll mechanically pre-screen, we'll biologically treat the waste, and then we'll ultimately refine the waste, uh, converting it into multiple products. So there'll be some traditional recyclable yield. Uh, there'll be a 40 to 50% yield in what comes in. Uh, will be converted into a renewable fuel. We'll have some inert materials, uh, and then ultimately about 20% or so of our incoming material will still be destined for landfills. So what do we do by you know, kind of implementing that process as opposed to the status quo. Uh, we're reducing CO2 and methane emissions by keeping waste out of landfills, keeping trucks off the road. Uh, we generate multiple revenue streams from the sale of fuel as well as the tip fees that we're charging municipalities and haulers. Uh, and because we've got a fixed cost operation with revenue on the way in and revenue on the way out, we can generate high, high margins. The facility in West Virginia, I uh, thought we'd share some actual kind of yields and statistics from West Virginia. Uh, again, because folks have been hearing me say, hey, we can convert the municipal solid waste into fuel for years. Well, we're actually doing it uh, today. So this is the first mixed municipal waste facility in the United States to use this patented process. Uh, as far as we know, we're the only technology-based solution out there that is successfully in scale converting municipal solid waste into either a fuel product or energy product uh, outside of mass flowing facilities like, you know, Covanta, for instance. Um, so what are we doing? We're producing a high-quality solid recovered fuel, which we call SRF, uh, that has met and exceeds cement industry uh, specifications. So our primary buyer at this point uh, are cement manufacturers. They're a huge consumer of coal, uh, so a very logical source to, for us to sell our fuel to. Uh, our BTU values have been ranging from 8,500 to 11,000 BTUs uh, per pound of material. So we're taking mixed municipal waste, residential trash, and converting about 40 to 45% of that 
into a product that burns about 70-ish percent or so uh, as efficient as, let's say, thermal coal. Um, 100% of our commercial and industrial waste. So we'll accept manufacturing scraps, uh, label scraps, uh, the non-residential trash in a uh, part of our facility uh, that will convert 100% of that material into a renewable fuel. Uh, and we're ultimately hitting right now somewhere between 20 and 25% of our material uh, is still going to end up destined for a landfill. So pretty consistent with what we expected uh, in the original mass balance. We're getting better every day, uh, and we're perfecting the process every day. Uh, we've helped now multiple U.S. manufacturers achieve their zero waste goals, so including some uh, Volvo, a company called Hub Labels, uh, Continental Films. These are manufacturing companies who have zero waste or sustainability goals and have not been able to achieve them because there hasn't been a solution for a large portion of their waste to be done, uh, to be utilized for anything other than landfill or mass burn. Uh, and our current fuel customers include Argos, uh, which is our largest buyer uh, and a South American cement manufacturer, uh, and Geocycle, which uh, happens to be, I think, the world's largest um, marketer of renewable fuels into the cement industry. Uh, on the right there, you can see some of the some of the statistics on the facility itself, designed to handle 110,000 tons a year. Uh, we'll generate somewhere between uh, 45 and 50,000 tons of fuel uh, that meets the specifications uh, I mentioned previously. Uh, we'll generate about $7 million of, uh, of annual revenue as well. This slide uh, on the photos here, just a quick example there. Uh, the pretty one on the top left is our facility in West Virginia. I think the more important ones are uh, most people don't understand what a cement manufacturing kiln looks like. So the two pictures on the right are uh, shots of the cement, uh, the cement manufacturing plant. The picture on the bottom right uh, is actually uh, two trailers of our fuel uh, being offloaded into the kiln. Uh, and mixed with coal at a um, at a seventy thirty ratio. So that's the actual utilization and how our fuel actually gets used. People have asked me many times, well, how did this happen? Uh, it happens in a traditional walking floor trailer. It's air injected. Uh, the little picture on the left is what our fuel actually looks like. That is some of our fuel, and then we just get blown into the kiln uh, to be used for energy. So Martinsburg uh, was commissioned in two thousand nineteen. Uh, later than what we had hoped, but we got it there. Uh, first full year of revenue will be this year. Uh, our facility in New York State is in late stage permitting. Uh, we're expecting to hopefully have our permits and begin construction sometime this year and commence operations later in 2021. Um, what's been really encouraging is the number of conversations, discussions, and projects that we've got in the pipeline right now uh, with private developers, but, but more so many municipalities who now understand they have an option. Uh, they have a crisis. They have diminishing landfill capacity. Uh, they're long hauling, long distances. Costs are going up. Uh, environmental impacts are growing. Um, they now know there is a municipal size solution that they could deploy. So the pipeline of, of, uh, the projects we've got with municipalities uh, and the level of interest has been really exciting. We call uh, the West Virginia facility the Disneyland of waste. We've had over 500 tours of that facility in just a short number of months. So uh, in addition, you know, the growing demand for alternative fuels uh, is also encouraging. So not only are we seeing more interest from cement manufacturers, but we have shipped products to various technology providers uh, that would like to use our fuel for either thermal treatment to create steam uh, and potentially electricity. Uh, some companies that believe they could use our product as a raw material for uh, the manufacturing of a sort of plastic-like material, composite material. So you know, now that we're creating this fuel, uh, the interest we've got and the uses um, seem to be growing. So that's that's pretty exciting as well. Not only do we see desire for sustainable waste disposal growing, 
but desire for alternative fuels, desire for alternative products uh, that are more sustainable, helping solve some of the mixed plastics problems and the recycling problems uh, is pretty encouraging for us. Moving on to our food waste digesters. Uh, yeah, this is this was our core product many years ago. We cater to you know the industries that you see on the slide here: restaurants, hospitality, grocery, healthcare, uh, maritime, uh, food services, and government. Uh, we've got models that support various levels of customer food waste volumes. So from small restaurants to industrial food supply services. Uh, I mentioned earlier. This is an on-site solution. Uh, we use an aerobic digester, which uses bacteria to rapidly decompose waste uh, and safely discharge it down the drain. Our costs are typically much less expensive than traditional waste disposal. Uh, gets our customers in compliance with ongoing regulations, which we believe will uh, will continue to grow and actually you know, we'll see get stronger once we come out of this COVID-19 crisis and then pre presents our customers with that real-time data and analytics so that they can really measure what are their diversion efforts and probably more importantly, can really understand their behavioral inefficiencies and hopefully become more efficient and save money and the environment by just being smarter buyers, smarter preparers, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, we've historically offered an, an attractive leasing model to our customers with no upfront costs, uh, or capital investment to the customer. We think that's going to be really important as we recover from this uh, this pandemic. Uh, our customers are going to be capital constrained, so cost-effective solutions for them where they can see bottom line savings and not have to deploy large amounts of capital up front uh, is going to be pretty important, we believe, uh, and act as a real catalyst for growth. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about how we offer that to our customers uh, a few slides after this. Uh, as I mentioned, data and analytics, transparency, unbelievably important, becoming more important. Our customers continue to tell us understanding what they're wasting is really helpful for them. Changing their behaviors is important, and they can't do it without real-time data and analytics. Accountability to regulatory authorities uh, and whatnot uh, is really important to them as well. So to be able to prove that they are actually achieving their goals and showing that in real time is important. So this is our patented process. Uh, it allows us to provide that level of data and transparency to our customers. Some of the uh, some of the more you know, the bigger inflection points uh, for this digestive business that we accomplished in late 2019. Uh, one, you know, received a huge purchase contract from Carnival Corporation. As everybody probably is aware, due to the virus, you know, the cruise lines, the airlines, the hospitality industry uh, is in a bit of a state of, of crisis right now. Um, however, we believe they will recover. Uh, in fact, Carnival just, uh, just priced and raised a whole boatload of cash. So clearly they plan on surviving. So um, yeah, we believe the cruise industry, the hospitality industries uh, will survive, as we all will. And when we come out of this, uh, we'll be stronger than ever. So Carnival uh, had some environmental issues in previous years uh, regarding ocean uh, disposal of their food waste, uh, microplastics contamination. So by deploying our technology uh, and choosing us, as their environmental technology partner to solve this food waste issue for them, uh, ultimately satisfying the EPA and the federal government uh, is really important to us. So while you know, there's a little bit of pause right now as we all come through this challenging time, uh, we believe the second half of the year, Carnival will pick up where they left off. Uh, we talk to them uh, many times a week. Uh, and they have told us, you know, this is a, a, all systems go. When we come out of this, we're sticking with our uh, objectives. We're sticking with our commitment to the environment, and we're a valued partner to them. So uh, we might be 90 days behind, you know, in delivering product than where we thought we'd be, but we're still super optimistic about the relationship we've got with Carnival and believe that will lead to the other cruise lines uh, as well. We do also have customers in other maritime industries, so freighters uh, and energy platforms where you know, large amounts of people are living out on the ocean uh, and they need a viable solution 
from disposing of their food waste that keeps them environmentally compliant. So uh, huge catalyst for us going forward. Uh, and then on the leasing side, where we historically offered uh, customers rental and leasing options uh, using our own balance sheet, we were able to partner with Crestmark uh, and a group out of Boston called U.S. Equity Funding, where they understand our technology, they understand our products, uh, and they're willing to offer cost-effective solutions to our customers uh, in, a, in a traditional leasing model that might look just like uh, any other piece of restaurant equipment, which uh, most of our customers are used to dealing with. So, you know, we've been able to kind of establish a relationship where we can still offer the customer that cost-effective solution without leveraging their capital and uh, and using an off-balance sheet leasing model with uh, either Crestmark or U.S. Equity. So, I think that's a big catalyst for growth for us uh, in 2020 and, and beyond. So, why bio high tech? Uh, we offer cost-effective, proven proprietary solutions, and we're a first mover. Uh, large target markets that are still at the early stage of adoption represent huge high-margin opportunities for us in the future. Uh, the corporate social responsibility, the zero-waste objective, is not slowing down. It is growing. So being at the forefront of providing uh, cost-effective environmental solutions as well as solving some of the alternative fuel mixed plastics problems in the, in the uh, United States is critical and crucial for us. Um, you know, the environmental benefits that we offer our customers can't be, it can't be compared to any other technology provider uh, that we're aware of. Uh, our growing customer base includes Fortune 500 companies as well as the government, and we've got a proven management team uh, with a successful track record. So uh, great reasons why our customers are entrusting us and making us their technology provider to solve their problems. And hopefully investors will, will do the same and understand the value um, of the products we offer and the fact that we're unique in that there are not other solutions available today that we're aware of that have been proven. Uh, and we're doing it on a daily basis. So uh, with that, Tony, I guess I'll wrap up and open up to uh, any questions. Well, thank you so much, Frank, for that overview. That was that was wonderful. I always love listening to your uh, your presentation, and it reminds me of the uh, the, the the term um, or the uh, uh, where the puck is going. <laughs> a lot of where the puck is going um, with what it looks like what you're what you're involved in. Um, so great overview. Um, congratulations on, on getting the uh, West Virginia facility up and running. Um, you know, now that you've been operating it for several months, can you can you tell us some things that are important about the, the facility and why you think it uh, should be implemented all over the country? Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, again, I I I, I said it uh, in the presentation and, and actually wasn't joking. I mean, we've had so many people refer to this place as uh, as Disneyland. Uh, the Disneyland of waste. Um, yes. There's not another facility uh, in the United States that is doing what we're doing. Uh, and when I say we've had over 500 visits, uh, those 500 are from uh, regulators. They're from U.S. senators. They're from Fortune 500 uh, company leadership. They're from municipalities and commercial waste haulers and whatnot. So, um you know, it, it truly is uh, an impressive facility, and when folks come down and see the fact that you know we're dumping you know residential trash into a reception pit, and you know they can walk through that plant and they can see step by step how that trash is converted into a byproduct that is being used to offset coal consumption, uh, and physically see it happen. Uh, and you can visit that cement kiln and see how they're using that fuel, people are all of a sudden saying, wow, see, it actually can be done, right? So municipalities who have been challenged, particularly in the Northeast United States, for years now with where are we going to go with this? Um, our county landfills are closing. How are we going to provide cost-effective disposal for our, our citizens and our taxpayers Understanding there is a viable, proven option. It's not, hey, this is working in your uh, pay. It's not, you know, about a question of is the European waste different than American waste? If it works in Europe, will it work here? The fact that we are proving it 
and the fact that our buyers of our fuel are asking for more, and we've got other technology providers coming around and saying, hey, um, we can use that product to create steam. We can use that product to create product. Um, has really been encouraging. And for companies like you know, Volvo, who have come down and saw the facility and have now diverted their waste to our facility, where it had previously been destined for a landfill, I think that's the proof, right? Is It's been this guy, Frank Selly, saying for years, hey, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this, right? And I think... You know, the traditional waste providers, the municipal officials have kind of been sitting on the sideline waiting to see does it actually work, right? right? Uh, and now you can see it. You can touch it, right? Uh, and that's, that's been huge. I mean, you know, since this has happened, since we've opened and we've started to produce on-spec fuel, the pipeline for projects is enormous. Uh, and the demand for the byproduct is enormous. So I think... Uh, you know, customers now have hope, right? Volvo has hope. Um, Hub Labels has hope. And, and we're working with many other Fortune 500 companies who have been saying, I need a solution. I need to get to be more sustainable. And no one has risen to the occasion. To understand that that option is now available to them is, is pretty satisfying to me. Uh, and I believe that by proving this, right, this will become the future uh, of waste in the United States. It will not solve 100% of the problem, Tony, as I've always told you, right? This is right. not, you know, the right. fact that we believe there won't be landfills in the future. This right. is, hey, look, where there is a crisis, this is an ability to offer a solution that will be not only cost-effective and control costs, but be a better environmental solution. So that's pretty satisfying for us. Yeah, that's, uh, the opportunities are evident. I mean, it's... It's pretty clear. I, I, I know that the um, um, the cement kilns are an obvious customer for the recover fuel, but could you just maybe talk about their potential uses for this uh, this alternative fuel? Yeah, I, we've had some inquiries. Uh, we've shipped product to a couple of companies, uh, European companies that are uh, using biomass uh, to uh, to create energy thermal treatment. Uh, so we're starting to see um, the kind of power folks start to take interest in this product and say, hey, I, I think we can use this as well. Uh, we're also seeing some interest from some of the smaller kind of entrepreneurial ventures who are aiming at trying to solve the plastics problem, you know, and how do we create a, we'll call it, recycled product out of something uh, with the plastics crisis in the U.S., so... Um, some folks have said, you know, they believe they can use our uh, our SRF as a raw material for some type of composite materials and whatnot. So I think we're going to continue to see that kind of stuff. For me, the next logical use will be in power generation. Yeah. Uh, it'll go from cement kilns to power generation. It's going to it'll work, right? We know the BTU value. We know the emissions profile. It'll work. It's just a matter of you know putting it into the right technology. Right. Maybe one last quick one. Uh, you know, you, you, you just talked about this on the on the um, uh, your presentation, but you released and announced uh, the important uh, an important customer win with with Carnival. Uh, can you tell us uh, how things are going uh, given the current uncertainties in, in the mm -hmm. market? Yeah, I mean, they, they, I mean the cruise lines uh, in general, not just Carnival, um, obviously, yeah. you know, are, are, are dealing with some pretty challenging times, um, as is the entire hospitality industry. I, I don't know many industries that aren't. Um, you know, look, our conversations with Carnival are fantastic. Um, yeah. you know, they know that they're going to sell their ships again. They just raised, I think, $7 billion, so they're going to be around. Uh, it's just a matter of when are those ships going to set sail again, and when they do, um, they've got an obligation to the federal government uh, to be more sustainable and to uh, deal with their food waste and their plastics challenges. And they've, got a, they've made a commitment to the environment, uh, and I, I, you know, they're going to live up to that commitment. Everything they've told us is we're moving forward. Uh, it's just a matter of when our ships sail again. So we look at this as kind of a, a momentary kind of blip for everyone, you know, for the entire world, unfortunately. But um, Carnival's going to survive, and the cruise industry is going to be around, just like they were for many, many years, and we're going to be a, a valuable technology provider to them, and we're happy to do that. 
Well, that, that's, uh, that's, that's great. That's a great overview, Frank. We always love having you uh, present. Uh, I could listen, listen to you talk about it all day and uh, just uh, all the interesting things going on and happenings in your, in your world. Thanks for being uh, here with us and look forward to having you back next year. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Tony.